morning. My name is Oscar Guardiola Rivera, and it is an absolute pleasure for me to introduce uh, to you uh, William Darlingpool. And I want to do so in the following manner, by quoting uh, one of my favorite writers on history, on the concept of history. This is what Walter Benjamin has to say about the job of the historian. It is one of the most noteworthy peculiarities of the human heart that so much selfishness in individuals coexists with the general lack of envy which every present day feels towards its future. This observation indicates that the image of happiness we cherish is thoroughly colored by the time to which the course of our own existence has assigned us. There is happiness, such as could arouse envy in us. Only in the air we have breathed among people we could have talked up uh, or to, women who could have given themselves to us. In other words, the idea of happiness is indissolubly bound up with the idea of redemption. The same applies to the idea of history. The past, which is the concern of history, carries with it a secret index by which it is referred to redemption. Doesn't the breathe of the air that pervaded earlier days caresses us as well? In the voices we hear, isn't there an echo of now silent ones? Don't the women we court have sisters they no longer recognize? If so, then there is a secret agreement between past generations and the present one. Then our coming was expected on, on earth. Then, like every generation that preceded us, we have been endowed with a messianic power, a power on which the past has a claim. Such a claim cannot be settled cheaply. Since he began working on uh, his uh, uh, first book, uh, following the steps of Marco Polo, William has been writing against the current fashion which would like to see the East, that I say the rest, erased from the history of the West. Uh, in that respect, he has reintroduced the notion of redemption in history, and in doing so, he keeps giving us hope. I'm sure you will agree with me that uh, in giving us hope, he makes us, he takes us one step closer to happiness. I give you William Dalrymple. I wish that whenever I gave a lecture, Oscar was there to introduce me. <laughs> and go drinking with the night before too. <laughs> Talking of which, thank you for getting out of your beds this morning. Uh, and uh, not everyone would uh, get up at, to be at 10 o'clock on a drich borders morning. Anyway, tonight, I mean this morning, I'm going to... <laughs> that's, a, that's a measure of the uh, coherence you're going to get out of me, I'm afraid. This morning, um, I'm going to talk about a book I haven't yet written um, and I'm working on. So this is very much a, a work in progress. But... Um, in April, uh, the Indian Supreme Court, presumably under pressure uh, from the Indian uh, Ministry of External Affairs, who'd had pressure put on them by the British, uh, came out with a bizarre ruling uh, that the Kohinoor diamond, which we have pictured in front of us here, uh, was not looted by the British, was not stolen, that it was given freely by the Sikh ruler Ranjit Singh as a gift to the British. Uh, and therefore, there was no question uh, of it uh, being uh, uh, sent back uh, to India or even being asked by the Indian government, which was the reversal of a long-standing claim which has existed since independence. Almost everything about this declaration by the Indian Supreme Court is factually incorrect. Um, the, 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 there are many, many things which are uncertain about the history of this uh, most famous of all gems. Uh, but uh, the one fact that is completely established, do, we have a, do I have access to a, uh, moving the, uh, how do I move the laptop, the images, I mean? Is there a, is there a bleeper, or can I, should I just say move? <laughs> um, the next, we, we're after the next picture. Can we move it up here? 
I've got a I've got a pointer. Oh, it's a, it's got remote, is it? Oh, it has. Well, that, oh, technology. Sorry, I told you it was going to be that kind of morning. Um, one of the few things that is certain in the history of this diamond was that uh, a full ten years after the death of Ranjit Singh, after the British had fought two wars with the Sikh Empire of the Punjab, uh, that the Kohinoor was forcibly handed over uh, by the boy king, uh, Dulip Singh, to Lord Dalhousie, a Scotsman, uh, who um, was the representative of the East India Company. Now, people still talk very loosely about the British conquering India, but something far more sinister happened. Uh, it wasn't the British who conquered India. It was a multinational company uh, with an international set of shareholders uh, many of whom lived in places like Paris and Amsterdam, uh, as well as uh, across the home counties of London, uh, home counties of England, and, uh, and large estates in the Scots borders. Um, and the East India Company uh, had conquered India uh, over a course of about 60 years, from about 1740 to 18, 1800. And the last big conquest, uh, the last battle, which really, uh, with an army that actually had a chance of beating the company armies, was these two. Anglo-Sikh wars uh, in the 1840s. Uh, and what part of the act of surrender was that the Punjab would be absorbed into the company territories, but that the Kohinoor, which had become incredibly famous by then, should specifically go to the Queen of England, as a, in a sense, as a personal gift by Lord Dalhousie, who had his eyes on his next job. He wanted to be foreign secretary. Uh, and he thought that if he could, he could get the Queen the diamond, uh, his chances would be improved. Now, as the garbled statement by the Indian Supreme Court shows. The Kohinoor, while it is made of the strongest substance in existence, has had an strange ability to attract a kind of airy fog of mythology about it. And from this moment that it uh, enters British hands and then gets displayed in the great exhibition uh, of 1851, 1849 it's handed over, Two years later, 1851, it's put on display in London, in the Crystal Palace. Mr. Chubb, whose ch Chubb locks we still use to secure our houses, created uh, this fantastic um, uh, glass safe uh, for the Kohinoor, which, if you tried to fiddle with it, uh, would swallow the Kohinoor up and take it into the depths of this uh, uh, in depths of this safe. And so people snaked r miles through the exhibition. There were four hour queues to see this. And in the aftermath of this, you had all these references in Victorian novels like The Moonstone. Benjamin Disraeli writes a novel called Lothair, uh, which the central character is an Indian diamond. Uh, and the mythology of this stone grew. So that it has become today, not only for Indians, but for uh, people around the world, and possibly even the British, the ultimate symbol of colonial loot. This is the object, uh, perhaps along, I suppose alongside, in a slightly different way, the Elgin marbles. Um, but uh, uh, these are the two objects uh, that, uh, that their respective homelands want back most. But as soon as you probe the history of the Kohinoor, you discover that, in fact, things are much more complicated. Uh, and if you look at the Wikipedia article up on, uh, uh, on Wikipedia today, it gives a version of the Kohinoor's history that was first constructed at the time of the handover. And Lord Dalhousie contacted a young um, wastrel in Delhi called Theo Metcalf, who I'd met before in my book, The Last Mogul, because he turns from this sort of, uh, sort of slightly flashmany character um, uh, taking girls out uh, on, on, into the river of Jumna and uh, uh, accumulating gambling debts and falling out with his father, turns by the end of the last mogul uh, at, the, at the 1857 into a proper war criminal. This guy, in his first job, is told to go around the jewelers of Delhi and collect the stories of this stone. And the document that Theo Metcalf put together in Delhi in 1849, uh, within a month of this act of handover, of the young Dulip Singh handing over the diamond to Lord Dalhousie, becomes the established story about 
uh, about the Koh-i-Noor, which has been repeated in article after article, book after book, right up to uh, the, the Wikipedia entry this morning, um, and has given this diamond a whole history, which, in fact, is totally fantastic. And I'll just read a bit from Theo's report. After interviewing all the jewelers of Delhi, talking to the members of the royal family, and he puts together this report, and he says, I cannot but regret that the results are so very meager and imperfect. Um, but he nonetheless lays out his, his findings for Dalhousie, who then, of course, sends it off to Queen Victoria. First wrote Theo, according to the traditions of the eldest jewelers in the city of Delhi, as handed down by family after family, this diamond was extracted from the mine koh noor four days' journey from Mazulipatam to the northwest, which is on the coast of India, uh, on the banks of the Godavari during the lifetime of Krishna, who is supposed to have lived 5,000 years ago. So immediately we're in the, in the kind of realm of mythology. Um, everything about this is wrong immediately. Indian diamonds are not mined. Uh, in actual fact, Indian diamonds are alluvial, and they exist in the beds of dead rivers. And you extract them rather like uh, those pictures, those movies of, uh, of gold rush um, uh, uh, people with pans in, in, in kind of American uh, cowboy movies. You, 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 sieve, you sieve alluvial deposit, and there, occasionally, you get a tiny octahedral crystal of, of diamond. And these tiny fragments of diamonds had been uh, existed as far as the world knew, only in India until the discovery of new mines in Brazil in 1725 and shortly after, at the end of the 19th century, in South Africa. But historically, uh, for, for most of human history, all the diamonds in the world have come from these alluvial deposits, these dead riverbeds in southern India, particularly in what's now Andhra Pradesh. Um, so there were never any diamond mines as such. Um, and uh, uh, there is simply no information about where this diamond actually existed, uh, or, or its history, uh, until much later, which we'll come to in a second. Nonetheless, Theo goes on, repeating the traditions that he's been told. He says, mined in the deepest mists of antiquity, uh, it was looted probably from a temple in southern India by the marauding Turks. Soon the jewel fell into the hands of the emperors of the Gori dynasty, then successively the Tukluk, Said, and Lodi dynasties, until eventually it came into the hands of the Mughals and remained in their possession until Muhammad Shah wore it in his turban, and when the uh, Persian emperor Nadir Shah came, he exchanged turbans, and so the diamond went to Persia. Now, in reality, none of this is history at all, and yet this story has, has persisted. And you only get the actual truth of the story of this diamond if you start looking in the Persian sources. And there are incredibly rich Persian sources for Indian history, uh, and it's very easy to tap these, because many of them are printed in modern editions out of Tehran or uh, Kabul. Um, and what I'm going to lay out for you today is the story, as I understand it, the actual historical story of the diamond, uh, which is quite different from the myth which has been propagated for 200 years. And what you find is that this diamond, which today people still think of as the greatest diamond in the world, actually today, I think, is the 152nd biggest diamond uh, in the world. Um, it was never the centerpiece uh, of the Mughals' uh, uh, riches. It, it's not referred to in a single Mughal source that I've been able to find. It was, however, uh, we're pretty sure, and it's recorded in the 1750s, as being part of the famous peacock throne. And it was the, the diamond seems to have been attached to the head of the peacock in the peacock throne, or possibly there were two peacocks, according to some version. One of them had the coin. So it was right up on the roof of this throne, uh, almost invisible, and is not actually referred to in a single Mughal document. And I spent the whole of the summer tracking down the different uh, accounts uh, 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 from the invasion of Nadir Shah, when we know the first historical fact that it seems to be establishable is that Nadir Shah comes to Delhi in uh, 1739, defeats the Mughals, and he brings back the peacock throne. And on the peacock throne, is this diamond. And we get, in 1751, what is the first reference to this stone, very late. I mean, you know, the Jacobite rebellions happened here in Scotland, Traquairs uh, uh, been visited by Bonnie Prince Charlie, all this has happened. And then six years later, uh, in 1751, 
we get the first ever description of the Kohinoor. And I'll read it out to you. Uh, it's never been uh, translated before. It exists in a, uh, a Persian source on the life of the Emperor Nadir Shah uh, by a historian called uh, Yazdimavi. And he writes about this extraordinary throne, the peacock throne. An octagon shaped like a European hat with circular brim had as its sides and canopy gilded and studded with jewels. On top of this was placed a peacock made of emerald and rubies, and its head was attached to a diamond the size of a hen's egg, known as the Kohinoor, the mountain of light, whose price no one but God could know. The wings were studded with jewels, many pearls, each the size of a pigeon's egg, were strung on a wire, attached to the pillars supporting the throne. Everything appertaining to this throne was adored with gold and jewels, the least of which weighed half a miktal, and the grounds was covered with pearl-edged braid. The throne and its railings were all in pieces, dismantled for transportation, and would be reassembled in order. The present writer saw this throne when the victorious armies had left Delhi and proceeded to the capital Herat, when it was, by royal command, propped up within the royal tent of Nada, along with two other rare gifts, a diamond known as the Darya Inur, the Sea of Light, and a ruby known as the Ain al-Hur, the Eye of the Huri. From this point, the Kohinoor begins to enter history, it, 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 and, and we'll go through its history now. Uh, but this seems to be the beginning of the story. It's only in 1751 that we actually have a reference to this stone. So to start at the beginning, diamonds existed only in India, found in alluvial beds in the south of the, uh, of the country, and were regarded as semi-divine in, in the Hindu Puranas. Um, in the Garuda Purnima, which is one of the, uh, one of the kind of uh, early 5th century texts, uh, there is given the legend of how diamonds came to exist. The, god, uh, the demon Bala agreed to be sacrificed by the gods, and he yielded up his good ghost for the good of the universe. And behold, the severed limbs of his sacrificed body were converted into the seeds of gems. Then the Yakshas and the Siddhas and the Nagas, all these uh, heavenly beings, eagerly rushed to collect the seeds of these gems. And there was mighty flutterings of celestial pinions and rustling of celestial garments in the heavens. The gods came riding in their aerial cars and carried away the seeds of the gems for their own use, some of which dropped down to earth through violent concussions of the air. And wherever they dropped, whether in oceans, rivers, mountains, or wildernesses, there originated mines of these gems through the celestial potency of their seeds. Of these gems and precious stones, some are endued with the virtues of expiating all sins or acting as a prophylactic against the effects of poison, snake bites, and diseases, while there are others which possessed of all contrary virtues. The learned hold that diamonds are the most effulgent of all precious stones. The least particle of bone of the conqueror Indra falling or dropping down from the sky in a country germinates diamond crystals of various shapes. Gods are supposed to dwell in particles of the diamond, wherever found, wherever they are possessed of a clear light shade and commendable features. Prosperity, long life, increase of wives and progeny and domestic animals, and the bringing home of a teeming harvest all attend on the use of a diamond, keen and well marked in its points, clear in luster, and divested of baneful traits. Serpents, tigers, and thieves fly from the presence of a person wearing a diamond. That, uh, uh, is not most people's experience if they wear diamonds, but uh, <laughs> fatal and dreadful poisons secretly administered prove inoperative against the system of a diamond wearer, and all his possessions a sort of, enjoy a sort of immunity from the acts of incendiarism or erosion by water. The complexion of such a person improves in its helpful glow, and his undertakings become prosperous and thriving. So no snake bites, you get really good, your acne disappears overnight, Thieves run away from your diamonds, uh, and you get extra, extra dogs and wives and children. It's, it's, it's all good. Um, so diamonds in Indian tradition, in Hindu tradition, are an incredibly positive uh, uh, thing to wear. And you find these tiny little diamond fragments, for most of the history of diamond wearing, uncut, just in their natural octahedral form, uh, passing through the globe very early on. 
they're being used as, uh, as, as stone cutting instruments at the time of the pyramids, already by about 3000 BC, diamonds are going from these coastal um, the alluvial deposits in southern India, reaching ancient Egypt. Um, in Rome, they become incredibly uh, auspicious objects. And you find these very elaborate rings uh, containing one tiny little fragment, because up until the 17th century, no one knows how to cut the rings, how to cut the diamond. Uh, and it's only with the invention of the brilliant cut in the 18th century that, you, that jewelers learn to, if you like, release the fire of a diamond. Uh, and this is the point much later on, uh, in the early 19th century, that the di diamond rings become uh, the, the habit in, in Europe and the price of diamonds rises worldwide. Now, everything in Indian culture tends, particularly North Indian culture, tends to come from the interplay of two different traditions. The traditions of the, uh, the ancient uh, Hindu kingdoms and how these interplay with successive uh, waves of, uh, of uh, Turkish, Persian, uh, and Arab uh, incomers from the 12th century onwards. And what's interesting, as in so many ways, is that in, in diamonds and in uh, gemology, there's a completely different set of likes and dislikes and, and a, a separate set of mythologies about gems in the Arab, Muslim, and Islamicate world. Now, in the, for the Mughals, the most beautiful of all gems are not diamonds, unlike the Hindu tradition. They are spinels and rubies. They like red stones. And Persian poetry is full of references to gleaming red stones. This is Nazami. When the spinel of the sun rose out of its mine, night gave its last breath for the love of day. And we know a lot about what the Mughals thought uh, uh, of gems because uh, the Emperor Akbar's historian, Abul Faisal, writes a, an enormous multi-volume work on the workings of the Mughal state. And one of the chapters is on the treasury. And it turns out that they have so many jewels already by the beginning of Mughal rule that there are several layers of treasury. And the most important and the prime one are the rubies and the spinels. And the diamonds are kept in the second division treasury. Uh, they're less valued. Um, but the Mughals are obsessed with the arts. There are virtually no other rulers in world history that have built their identity so closely on the performance of art, on having miniature paintings painted, on enjoying, Shah Jahan is painted, is, is painted here holding a part of his collection of rubies. Um, and uh, they collect diamonds and rubies on an incredible scale. The Mughals own the greatest collection of gems that have ever uh, existed in the world. And as their rule expands out from North India towards the south, they begin to uh, absorb into their empire the great diamond mines uh, now in Andhra Pradesh, the great diamond uh, uh, deposits in Andhra Pradesh. And, and Jahangir actually goes out and wages a particular campaign on the Godavari River so as to collect uh, the, uh, the, the Golconda uh, diamond uh, deposits. Um, and by the time that the first British ambassador turns up at the court of Jahangir, the emperors are literally flooded with gems. And for their kind of you know, grubby contemporaries in the West stumbling around in sort of cod pieces, uh, the, these are the most glamorous figures uh, in the world. And the word mogul attaches itself to the English language so that today when people talk about Donald Trump being a property mogul uh, or, uh, or somebody else being a film mogul in Hollywood, uh, they are appropriating the proper name of this dynasty, the Mughals, the Mughals, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it has lodged itself permanently in the English language as a synonym for power and might. Here's Thomas Rowe, the English ambassador, the first English ambassador, um, on what it's like to meet the Emperor Jahangir. This, he's been sent off by um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and he arrives to see the Emperor clothed or rather laden with diamonds, rubies, pearls, and other precious vanities, so great, so glorious. His head, neck, breast, arms, above the elbows, at the wrists, his fingers, each one with at least two rings, are fettered with chains of diamonds, 
rubies as great as walnuts, some greater, and pearls such as mine eyes were amazed at. In jewels, which is one of his felicities, he is the treasury of the world, buying all that comes and heaping rich stones as if he would rather build with them than wear them. So as during the reign of Jahangir, they do begin to absorb all the greatest minds of India which exist in, in, in the south. And by the time of Shah Jahan, there's a problem what to do with all these. They've got so many they've accumulated. Uh, and Shah Jahan, who is the son of Jahangir, comes up with this as the answer to the problem. They build the peacock throne, which is more like a sort of little, little um, kiosk or a um, sort of thing you sell ice creams from uh, 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 than, a, than, a, than a throne in the Western sense. Uh, but it is so laden with jewels that it costs five times as much as the Taj Mahal to build. Uh, and um, initially, interestingly, it is a Frenchman who is commissioned to build this thing. Because it, by the 17th century, the beginning of diamond cuttings uh, is beginning to be perfected. There's already a big Jewish community in Amsterdam that are cutting diamonds. There's a long scholarly argument about where diamond cutting begins. It could easily begin in India. Uh, but it reaches a level of perfection in Amsterdam and Venice very early on. And then some merchants seem to take it to Aleppo, which we've been hearing a lot about uh, in uh, the, the siege of Aleppo in the last few days. Uh, Aleppo had a large uh, Levant company uh, and other Frankish merchants' presence by the 17th century. Uh, and, this, and many of the Mughal stones are sent over to, uh, to traders in Aleppo to be cut and then sent back to India. Uh, sometimes they send it with the Jesuits, uh, which uh, Oscar will approve of. Uh, to, they go down to Goa, and then they're sent off to Aleppo for cutting and then sent back again. Um, so uh, uh, the two things that the Mughals um, want out of Europeans are artillery. Already you have a premium on, on, on Western cannon makers. And the other thing is jewelers. In every other way, uh, uh, the Mughals regard the Europeans as savages. Uh, but they've got these two talents, as far as the Mughals are concerned, making guns and cutting diamonds. And in the end, uh, uh, Augustine Heriat, who is the guy who's originally given this commission, um, goes off to Goa uh, for reasons that are unclear. And instead, the commission to build the peacock throne, the, the most magnificent piece of jewelry ever, uh, most magnificent piece of furniture ever made, goes instead to a Persian poet called Saeed Gilani. Um, and he is a poet and calligrapher turned goldsmith and jewel master. And uh, the commission is made at about the same time as the Mughals are beginning to move from Agra to the new city of Shah Jahanabad, uh, now Old Delhi. And uh, Delhi is under construction, the Jama Masjid is coming up, the Chandni Chak is being laid out. And at this supreme moment of wealth and power, this great throne uh, is commissioned. And, uh, it is meant to convey to anyone who is literate with Persian poetry or the Quran, it's meant to evoke the throne of Solomon as described in the Quran. Uh, and uh, the whole of the arrangement and the, uh, it, it, the, the, for example, the pillars are shaped like cypress trees. There are peacocks on the throat. It's meant to be a, a, a jeweled garden, um, which is the description of, uh, of Solomon's throne in the Quran. And Mumtaz Mahal uh, is, is compared in the poetry, which is uh, inscribed on its sides, as the new queen of Sheba. Um, Ahmed Shah Lahori, the official um, historian of Shah Jahan's reign, writes the description. He says, in the course of many years, so many valuable gems had come into the imperial jewel house, each which might serve as the eardrop for Venus or would adorn the girdle of the sun. At the accession of the emperor, it occurred to his mind, in the opinion of far-seeing men, that the acquisition of such rare jewels and the keeping of such wonderful brilliance can only render one service, that of adorning the throne of empire. They ought therefore to be put to such use that beholders might share in and benefit from their splendor and that their majesty will shine by increased brilliance. So he, recalls, he, he records how the, the imperial jewel houses are turned out and all these jewels are laid out in front of this Saidi Galani, uh, and he has to come up uh, with an object which can contain this mass of gems. 
the outside of the canopy was to be of enamel work studded with gems. This is uh, the Padshah Nama recording the, the, the building of this thing. The inside was to be thickly set with rubies, garnets, and other jewels, and it was to be supported on 12 emerald columns. On the top of each pillar, there was to be two peacocks set with each gem, and between each of the two peacocks, a tree set with rubies and diamonds, emeralds and pearls. The ascent was to consist of three steps set with jewels of the finest water. The throne was completed in the course of seven years at a cost of 100 lakhs. And again, the Taj Mahal was 25 lakhs to compare. Um, and then, very interestingly, he singles out one stone which was set in this, and it's not the Kohinoor. Uh, he, he talks about the great Timur ruby. And, and, this, and so for the Mughals, the ruby was the thing. And the Kohinoor is there, attached to the peacock, but it's not mentioned by the Mughal sources. They valued it, but it wasn't their kind of number one um, uh, uh, spectacle. So it stays in the peacock throne uh, during the great years of Mughal glory in the, in the mid-17th uh, century. But by uh, the 18th century, things are beginning to crumble. And the death uh, of the Mughal Empire occurs in an extraordinary battle in 1739 at the hands of an extraordinary man called Nadir Shah. The ruler at this point is a man called Muhammad Shah Rangila, who uh, likes to play uh, holy with courtesans. He commissions pictures of himself smoking his hookah and indeed making love, which is a first in uh, Mughal art. Uh, and he meets this rather less playful character at, at the field of battle of Karnal in 1739. And this man is Nadir Shah. Not a name many people probably are familiar with in the borders, but one of the most extraordinary figures in Indian and Middle Eastern history. Nadir Shah was the son of a shepherd. He rose through military service uh, to become the, uh, the main general of the last of the Safavid Shahs of Isfahan, and then overthrew the Safavid himself. And he is a meritocrat. He's risen entirely on the basis of his military capabilities. And uh, the Mughal army is this glorious thing with jeweled elephants, and, uh, but it's very old-fashioned. They believe in sword play, big cavalry attacks, uh, and, uh, and all the kind of chivalry of, uh, of knighthood that exists in, in Tudor England and the field of the cloth of gold exists in the Mughal world. It's all about sword play. It's all about uh, uh, two men facing each other in battle. Nadir Shah has none of this. Nadir Shah uh, takes note of advances in European artillery and invents something called the swivel gun. And it's basically an armor-piercing musket, a big, heavy musket, that he manages to fix on the top of, uh, on the neck of a horse. Um, uh, uh, and when the Mughals and Nadir Shah confront each other at Karnal in 1739, there are, the Mughal camp has 1.5 million men in it. And they are met with just 100,000 Persians. And uh, Nadir Shah has this classic tactic. He lures the Mughals to come and attack him. And at the last minute, the light cavalry part like a curtain. And facing the, uh, the Mughal cavalry are a line uh, of 50,000 mounted swivel guns. Uh, and they, the Mughals just charge at them. Uh, and it's like the first day of the Somme. Uh, a single volley from these massed swivel guns pierces the Mughal armor uh, and the uh, 100,000 uh, moguls lie dead in the first 15 minutes of the battle. Nadir Shah is a very clever guy. He, he, he's, he's extremely pragmatic. He then invites Na uh, Muhammad Shah Rangila to dinner. And Muhammad Shah comes over with all his courtesans and his wives and so on. And then, of course, he's not allowed to leave. Uh, so he captures the Mughal emperor. And together, as brothers, uh, they go into Delhi. And there then occurs one of the most extraordinary acts of looting in world history. The British clear out Bengal 100 years later very efficiently. But the big loot is this time in 1739. And Nadir Shah escorts the emperor into his own palace uh, with his own bodyguard, and then just loots the city and the palace. And they find that there are five layers of vaults under the Red Fort, all filled uh, with the, the, the loot of uh, of Afghanistan, Iran, and India over 300 years of Mughal rule. Uh, and the whole lot are loaded up and sent off back to Persia, including uh, the, uh, the peacock throne. Um, and for two months, 
they sit in the red fort melting down gold into ingots so it could be carried. Um, in all, 12,000 wagons filled with gold and jewels leaves Delhi at the end of the summer uh, of 1739, as well as 700 elephants, 4,000 camels. Many pack animals carrying priceless loads of jewels and solid gold were lost in the monsoon floodwaters as the army crossed the swollen river Chenab. Many others fell down steep cliffs as the army wound its way through the Hindu Kush. But the great majority of this extraordinary loot uh, found its way uh, back to uh, uh, Khorasan. And then Nadir Shah is faced with the same problem as Shah Jahan. What do you do with all these jewels? So he's already got the peacock throne with, with what, you know, what was 100 years earlier, the, 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 the cream of the treasuries. He then decides to build a jeweled tent. Uh, and this is the, the greatest sort of glamping uh, tent uh, ever, uh, ever constructed. The tent was ordered to be pitched at the Diwan Khanna in Herat, uh, in which was placed the Tokht uh, Itafi, the peacock throne. Publication was made by the beat of a drum through the city and the camp that all persons had the liberty to come and, and look at this magnificent exhibition of jewels such as never been seen in any country. The outside of the tent was covered with the finest scarlet broadcloth. The lining was of violet satin, on which were representations of birds and beasts, trees and flowers, the whole made of diamonds, pearls, and rubies, emeralds, and amethysts, and other precious stones. The tent poles were decorated in a like manner. Nothing you can get at Glastonbury today in the VVIP enclosure even begins to come close to this. On both sides of the peacock throne, there was a screen. Anyway, you get the idea, jewels dripping everywhere. Now, Nadia Shah is this extraordinary military genius, but he, as in, in, sort of in classic form, becomes a total megalomaniac, having conquered not only the Mughal Empire and the Persian Empire, but then taken over most of Afghanistan. And he's heading now uh, to try and take over Central Asia and model himself on his idol, Timur. Uh, and there is an assassination attempt, uh, which he assumes is the work of his son. So he has his son and heir blinded. Uh, and, uh, and thereafter descends into a, into a madness, leaving heaps of skulls everywhere. And there's a fantastic account by another Jesuit, uh, Per Bazin, uh, who is his personal physician, who somehow got the job of looking after Nadir Shah, who describes this sort of carnage wherever Nadir Shah goes towards the end of his life. At the beginning of his life, when he goes to dinner, he's very pragmatic, he doesn't kill anyone ne unnecessarily, hence this business of capturing the emperor and inviting him to dinner. But by the end, he's become this kind of monster. So his own family and imperial bodyguard conspire to assassinate him. And um, they go in at night. He gets up out of his tent, and, and there's a great sort of bit of sort of rather filmic sword play. And eventually his, his hands are cut off, and then his head is cut off. Uh, what happens to the Koinor? What happens to the Peacock Throne? It's never been established, but it turns out that the Afghan chronicles have a record of it. And uh, a man called Ahmed Shah Abdali is the head of the Afghan bodyguard. And he's been raising up, Nadir Shah has been raising up these Afghan bodyguards as a counterweight to his own Persian guards. And there is a pitch battle over Nadir Shah's body between the Persian and the Afghan guard. Uh, and the Afghans guard the royal harem, according to the Afghan sources, which may be self-serving, but this is the only account we have. And in the morning, Nadir Shah's queen hands over the Kohinoor, which presumably by this point has been detached from the peacock throne. Uh, and it's given to Ahmed Shah Abdali, who canters off to uh, Kandahar and founds Afghanistan. So Afghanistan, uh, and on the way he captures a, uh, uh, one of Nadir Shah's jewel convoys um, and takes this off. And over the next generation, Ahmed Shah Abdali builds the first Afghan empire based in Kandahar. And he, again, has this... He, 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 defeats all comers on all sides, takes over Kashmir, northern India, a bit of Iran. Uh, but he is defeated by a foe more intractable uh, than any, uh, than any uh, uh, soldier, which is he has this terrible uh, tumor which eats up his face. Uh, and it starts in his nose and spreads out. And so halfway through his conquest, just when he's at the peak of his power, he, has, he, he builds rather like Robocop. Uh, he, he, he covers half his, his face in silver, again studded with all the diamonds that he's got. Uh, and uh, he, and uh, then there's a very unpleasant end to the story when uh, maggots begin to form in his nose and drop into his mouth, and it all gets a bit nasty. 
Uh, anyway, the da <laughs> but he, so it's at this point that people begin to start talking about the curse of the koh because whoever has got it, uh, everything begins to go badly wrong in their lives. And uh, it passes to his son, Timur Shah, who's a, who's a kind of dwarf, uh, who, who has a jeweled footstool made so that he can stand up and look everyone in the face. Um, but he wears the koh on his arm. And his son, uh, uh, Shah Zaman, uh, loses this short-lived Afghan empire. And having been defeated by his enemies, he's, uh, he, he asks for shelter uh, at the top of the Khyber Pass one night, and he's taken prisoner. And the Shinwari tribe have a discussion about what to do, and they decide to blind him. So in between being captured and being blinded, he hides the koh in a crack in his prison cell. Uh, and he's then blinded. And 10 years later, his son, who's called Shah Shuja, this looks like a dwarf from, uh, uh, from The Hobbit, but this is actually uh, Shah Shuja. We have a better picture of him here. Um, uh, Shah Shuja comes to power, and he sends out a search party to try and find what's happened to the great Timur Ruby and to the koh i -Nor. And uh, they find that, uh, the, uh, that a mullah has been using it as a paperweight for the last 10 years. He doesn't know what it is. Uh, and he has his sermons piled up underneath this great stone. It's sitting on uh, his desk. Uh, uh, anyway, so Shah Shuja um, comes into contact for the first time with the British. The East India Company is now rising to power. Uh, and the first British description of the koh i uh, is uh, from another lowlander, a border of Mount Stuart Elphinstone. Uh, and Manchester Elphinstone sees Shah Shuja um, uh, in uh, his Durbar in Peshawar uh, and describes this great diamond. And this is the first reference we have in, in, a, in a British source uh, to the Kohinoor. At this point, it's being worn as an armlet uh, by Shah Shuja. Now, shortly after this, Shah Shuja falls from power and his wife takes refuge with the Sikh leader, Ranjit Singh, who has uh, carved out from the, from the Punjab portion of the Afghan empire a new Sikh empire. And Ranjit Singh makes a deal with Shah Shuja's wife, Wufa Begum, that if he springs Shah Shuja from the prison he's being held in, then he can have the koh i -Nor. So Ranjit Singh uh, does what he, he, he promises to do. He goes, invades Kashmir, gets Shah Shuja uh, out of prison, and takes Shah Shuja back to Lahore, uh, where poor Shah Shuja discovers that his wife has given away his most valuable and last surviving possession. Uh, and, there's, um, uh, and he doesn't agree to hand over the diamond. He's hidden it somewhere. No one knows where it is. Um, anyway, the Ranjit Singh loses patience eventually, uh, and uh, he tortures Shah Shuja's son until uh, Shah Shuja yields up the diamond. And you can see um, that Ranjit Singh in this picture uh, on his armlet is wearing the koh i uh, uh, on his arm. It's uh, the British begin to set their eyes on this stone at this point. And what's happened in the meantime is the brilliant cut has been invented. Uh, diamond rings uh, have begun to become the, uh, the thing you do in engagements. And as a result, um, uh, there is a massive demand for diamonds across, uh, uh, across Europe, and the price has risen. So suddenly, the koh i -Nor, having been one of a number of uh, of important stones, along with these great rubies, becomes, begins to become the great celebrated stone. And when uh, uh, Ranjit Singh dies, uh, the, the uh, Punjab descends into anarchy, and the East India Company eventually goes and invades it. Uh, and the famous handover to uh, Dulip Singh takes place. And within a year of it going to, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's sent off to um, Lord Dalhousie, uh, who forgets that he's put it in his waistcoat pocket. Uh, and, uh, and a month later, the, the courier comes to escort the koh i -Nor down to Bombay, where it's going to be shipped off to the Great Exhibition. And he, th he has this moment, like, oh, Christ. <laughs> so he, he, he asks his valet, uh, do you remember I was wearing this particular suit on the, uh, when we were in Lahore? And he said, yes, sir. And he said, was there, anything, uh, was there anything in the pocket? No, sir. Uh, and, and then they kind of rattled around. And they said, oh, yes, there was a box containing a piece of old glass. <laughs> and luckily, luckily, the valet has put the box containing the piece of old glass in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a drawer somewhere, and it's brought out. Uh, but then this sort of mysterious curse of the koh i uh, begins to follow its way uh, 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 to Bombay, because the... the, the uh, Diamond is put under lock and key 
into the hold of the ship Medea. And within a day of leaving Bombay port, cholera breaks out on the ship. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen the Nosferatu, the, 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 the Herzog uh, uh, movie, where uh, there's the plague ship and all the rats. It's like that. Uh, the, sh the crew begin to die off. Uh, there are two guards of the Koinor, who one of whom dies, one of whom doesn't. They, land, they try to land at Mauritius, but the, Mar the Mauritius uh, 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 coast guard shell them, uh, won't allow them to land. They then head up in a storm. So this wreck of a ship uh, with one guard alive and half a captain stat sort of attached to the wheel lands at Portsmouth. Um, whereupon the, uh, the diamond is properly taken straight off to the Great Exhibition and becomes at this point, but not before, this symbol of imperial loot. And this is the centerpiece of the, uh, of the Great Exhibition. But it's rather like the Millennium Dome. It's a flop. Um, and uh, they, everyone's slightly disappointed by the Koinor. The special safe has been made. And they try various ways of lighting it, but it, it, it's, it's dull. And the reason everyone's disappointed is that there has grown up a differentiation between mogul taste for diamonds, which they prefer to uncut cabochons uh, as they've come out of the, uh, the earth, and, and all that's important for the moguls is in the size of the thing, uh, as opposed to European taste, which expects a brilliant, um, beautifully symmetrical. But the Koinor has a very particular and complicated mineral structure. And when, at the end of the Great Exhibition, they decide to cut it, this is Dulip Singh as a young man uh, who arrives at the, at the court of, uh, uh, of Queen Victoria, Queen, uh, converts to Christianity, to the thrill of the, uh, of the, uh, 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 the queen, uh, and, uh, and then gives her the diamond a second time, although it isn't his to give by this point. Uh, anyway, here's Dulip Singh. The, they decide to recut the diamond so that it goes into, uh, uh, into European form. And it's a huge cock up. Um, now, it, it, it's already now become this great celebrity object. And so the beginning of the cut is done by, the, uh, by none other than the Duke of Wellington, as an old man, um, who has no sooner uh, touched this diamond than he falls over and has a stroke the following week. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as, is the, as is so often the way. And here, here, is, here is the illustrated London News picture of the Duke of Wellington beginning the recut of that. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a huge mess. Um, the, they tried to cut the diamond against the, against the planes, uh, uh, the structure of the diamond, uh, which is one of the kind of basic laws of diamond cutting is broken. And at the end of it, there's, uh, the, the container of the diamond melts because it's got so hot. Diamonds are just carbon. They're the same stuff as coal, and they burn. So the diamond begins to burn uh, and, and is in the process of, sort of disappearing into, into the most expensive smoke uh, ever, uh, uh, ever uh, 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 fulged into the atmosphere. And um, at the end of it, it loses two thirds of its weight. So when um, uh, Dulip Singh um, uh, sees it uh, uh, and, and hands it back to Queen Victoria, it's a, it's a fraction of the diamond that he handed over to Dalhousie uh, all these years before. Now, it, it remains, uh, because of the story of the curse, uh, a version of the uh, thing, it only affects men, that women are immune to the curse of the Koinor. So it's in the, uh, it was in the Queen Mother's uh, throne and may yet um, uh, land in the, th in the, uh, the, the uh, crown of Queen Camilla, and if that doesn't finish off the monarchy, nothing else will. <laughs> oh, ye Republicans in the audience, pray for that. <laughs> but it's, I think, a, um, a, a, a fascinating object because it shows how central mythology is to uh, politics and history. This diamond is not mentioned in a single Mughal source. It's not the biggest diamond in the world. There were two bigger diamonds always uh, in the Mughal treasury, which was the Daryanur uh, and the Orlov uh, stone. The Orlov is, a, just, uh, I know it's past, you know, just, uh, is, it, many of these diamonds seem to attract uh, bad luck, the Hope Diamond being the most famous example. But uh, the, the Orlov diamond was probably part of Nadir Shah's tent. Uh, and when and when the um, Nadir Shah is killed and the face-off takes place between the, uh, the, the Afghan guard and the Persian guard, um, someone runs off with the, the Orlov, which is uh, at this point known as the Great Mughal Diamond. It appears 
Two years later, uh, an Armenian merchant arrives on a ship in Amsterdam with this uh, great stone that he's bought somewhere from this loot. And it's bought by Count Orlov, who is uh, a Russian aristocrat who's a lover of Catherine the Great. Um, and he, he spends, he, you know, he hocks his estate, he, he, he spends everything to get this enormous diamond, which is the largest diamond in the world in a way that Koh-i-Noor is not. And he arrives back and presents it to, he, he times his arrival so as to arrive on Catherine's name day. And he comes up in court and gives it to Catherine, only to find that in his absence, Potemkin has replaced, uh, has replaced uh, uh, him in, uh, in the bed of the queen. And uh, uh, that uh, his family has been disgraced. And Catherine, who's very pragmatic, accepts the diamond. Uh, <laughs> and then more or less tells him to bugger off. Uh, and poor old Count Orlov dies raving in a Russian lunatic asylum uh, a couple of years later, having destroyed his family fortune. Um, so in all, these diamonds are, are, are probably best left where they are. Um, and I mean, I, I've, I've summarized history, but we have blinding, slow poison, several tortures to death, burning in oil, uh, threats of drowning and assassination. Um, and uh, I think though, it, it, also, it's a very interesting story because it encapsulates in one object the question, a burning question, of what, how do we look on imperial loot? Do we simply say that uh, we robbed the world merrily for 200 years, but that's all part of the rough and tumble of history? Uh, we should no more give it back than, than, than we should demand reparations from the Vikings or the, the government of Norway for uh, looting Lindisfarne in the, in the 8th century? Uh, or, or, or do we... Um, attempt to right the wrongs of the past. Uh, on the 27th of July 2016, the, the Indian government made a statement announcing that they would be exploring all ways and means for obtaining a satisfactory resolution to the Koh-i-Noor. Uh, this followed months of confusion when they'd earlier announced that, uh, uh, that the Koh-i-Noor was not looted. Um, but what I think the Indians forget is that there are other claims. Uh, last year, a court order was lodged in the High Court of Lahore uh, for the return of the Koh-i-Noor to Lahore, where Ranjit Singh lived. Um, the Iranians have lodged a claim, and, uh, uh, and recently the Taliban have claimed the stone. Uh, so it's going to be a merry free-for-all for this cursed diamond, and uh, I think this story will be one to watch in the years to come. So thank you. Thank you.